Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today it's all about satellites in low, low, low orbit, and ESA's announcement of an air-breathing ion thruster, which is supposed to help them not decay rapidly. For example, right now, uh, as we're speaking, it's about a week before the expected re-entry date of the Tiangong spacecraft. China lost control of it a couple of years ago, and it's been slowly decaying ever since. As far as our frail human bodies are concerned, 200 kilometers up is essentially hard vacuum. Yes, there is oxygen and nitrogen up there, but not enough for our lungs to actually work. The air density is about 3 times 10 to the minus 9 kilograms per cubic meter compared to about 1.22 kilograms per cubic meter at sea level. Now, the spacecraft is moving at orbital velocity, about 7.5 kilometers per second, and for every square meter of cross-section, it's encountering about 22 milligrams of atmosphere per second, and maybe now generating about 100 millinewtons of drag. Now, these are very, very rough estimates, and the atmospheric density actually changes from one place to another. The spacecraft orientation is changing, and so we can't actually get a good estimate of the impact time. Uh, right now, we're like a week away with plus or minus two days of, of error. But it might surprise you to know that the US actually intentionally flew satellites at even lower altitudes. The early keyhole satellites in the Corona program wanted to be as low as possible so that their satellite photographs would be as high resolution as possible. Many of them flew at altitudes of about 160 kilometers, but some were as low as 120. They would only have to work for days or weeks because after they used up their onboard film, they would return it in a return capsule, which would float back to Earth and then be captured in mid-air by some fancy flying pilots. But at such low altitudes, the spacecraft would be designed to be as aerodynamic as possible. They literally looked like the upper stage of the uh, Thor Agena rockets that they were launched on. There were no solar panels deployed because those would, of course, add drag and reduce the life of the satellite. This low drag requirement drove one of the primary design features of the RORSAT series of satellites from the Soviets. These were ocean radar reconnaissance spacecraft, and again, they wanted to be as low as possible, although they only came down to about 250 kilometers. Now, because they were running large radars, they needed large power supplies. But if they used solar panels, the drag would, of course, slow them down and reduce their operational life. So the design included a working nuclear reactor. Now, these were actively managed spacecraft with onboard propulsion that would ensure that they maintained the correct altitude. However, as the fuel began to run out, the spacecraft were designed to take the nuclear reactor and boost it into a graveyard orbit rather than having it fall back to Earth. So yes, there are a handful of old Soviet nuclear reactors in orbit around the Earth. But more recently, ESA has flown a science spacecraft at a 250km orbit. They are Gravity Field and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer, also known as GOSI, we used an ion thruster to maintain constant altitude. The spacecraft wanted to be as low as possible because its primary mission was to examine the subtle gravitational variance caused by the oceans, the land, and everything else on Earth. And that spacecraft mission lasted until it exhausted its 40 kilograms of xenon propellant for its thrusters. After that, there was nothing to stop the atmosphere pulling it down until it decayed in November 2013. And it's this spacecraft which was cited in ESA's recent press release announcing that they now have an air-breathing ion engine. Now, this is a logical enough concept. You know, at one end, you have an air intake, which can take the very rarefied atmosphere and compress it down. And at the other end, you have an electrostatic or ion thruster of some sort, which can actually work with oxygen and nitrogen found at those altitudes. Now, the press release very specifically talks about how they tested this system in a vacuum chamber. Initially, they started by flowing in xenon at the velocities and densities expected at this altitude, and they were able to get the thruster to fire. Then, after some work, they were able to switch over to oxygen and nitrogen. And the, the engineers say that the moment they knew that this was working was when the color of the exhaust changed from the brilliant blue of the xenon to the purple of the oxygen and nitrogen. Now, it's worth talking a little more about the details of this air intake system. So, first of all, 
when you are operating an air intake on Earth, you can essentially treat the atmosphere as a fluid. But as you go higher and higher up, the individual particles in the gas, they start to travel longer and longer distances before they bounce off each other. So at the altitudes they were working at, they were dealing with uh, mean free paths, that is the distance between particle collisions, that could be measured as high as a meter or so. So if their, their intake was off this size, so it's entirely possible that the particles would come in and bounce off the intake and then bounce back out and not meet anything else. So it actually requires a lot of careful design to take this very rarefied particle stream and then slow it down and turn it into a fluid at sufficient pressure that they can feed these engines. At 250 kilometers up, we are still relatively deeply inside the atmosphere and most of the molecules are not ionized. So you can't use electromagnetic means to slow down the particles without touching them. But most studies estimate that uh, collection efficiencies might be as high as 40%. And that capture efficiency is important because regardless of whether it gets captured or not, it generates drag. So as the capture efficiency drops, the exhaust velocity has to get higher and higher to balance out the drag. The exhaust velocities required are measured in tens of kilometers per second, which pretty much means no chemical thrusters will work. But there are a whole plethora of electrical systems which work just fine. Ion thrusters, Hall effect thrusters, and even things like pulsed plasma thrusters. All of them have their pros and cons, but to me it looks like the one they are demonstrating is a Hall Effect thruster, which I believe was being investigated by the University of Toulouse, so that would line up with ESA doing this. Now, what's also not clear is, is there an intermediate tank? Is that required? Because some designs of engines will require a minimum flow rate before they can start firing, and if the intake is unable to provide that at the atmosphere they're working at, then they would need to have some sort of accumulator and release system. Similarly, I have questions about what kind of power is required for this. Because again, if you remember, if you're at low altitude and you're using solar panels, the nose inevitably add drag. The concept art does take account of this and shows a spacecraft covered with solar panels, but not with any extending out into space like giant sails. Also, the design will need batteries because they're going to have to operate this in the day and the night side of the planet. If you only fired the engines when you were on the daytime side, then what would inevitably happen would be that on the night side, the apogee would rise, and on the daytime side, the perigee would drop until the spacecraft eventually couldn't maintain altitude. Another interesting question is how low can this operate at? Because as you get lower down, obviously you get more and more air to propel yourself and you have to use all that to offset the incoming uh, drag. But that then means you need more and more electrical power, which means more and more solar panels. So there is probably a point at which the amount of solar panels you have to add is offset by the amount of drag that they bring and you end up reaching a lowest ceiling before you start to decay. There's also the question of the long-term operation of these thrusters when you account for the chemical effects. Now, electrical thrusters frequently operate using noble gases because the reaction rate is practically zero. Oxygen and nitrogen ions are, however, much more reactive. Indeed, these atoms are frequently found as core components of rocket fuels. So repeated contact by these highly active chemicals with the walls of the electrical thrusters could lead to long-term degradation. And so far, I haven't seen any details on this from the design team. So obviously, this is very cool because it opens up a whole new regime of a space where satellites could operate for long periods of time. But simultaneously, the details are kind of vague, and I'll, I'll be looking out for the more technical publication at some point. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.